depression, uh, not a happy subject, but something that <laughs> all of us need. And uh, we talked about the idea of empathy when we're dealing with depression in other people and we're seeking to minister to them. The next thing that I, I'd like to bring up is the idea of loving people who are struggling with depression or as the Bible puts it, having compassion upon them, even as the Lord Jesus had compassion on the widow uh, here in the city of Nain. Now we read earlier this evening, it happened the day after that he went into a city called Nain and many of his disciples went with him and a large crowd. And when he came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a large crowd from the city. So there's a, a large crowd with him, and a large crowd from the city uh, was with her. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. So one of the things that, that occurred to me is the progression as you go through the text uh, of compassion that is how did it unfold in the life of Jesus and there are certain things that go on with the Lord Jesus that that I cannot match of course there are things that I can't do for people that he can do but this progression is certainly within reach many of the disciples uh, were there there's a large crowd with Jesus a large crowd coming out of the city and what struck me is that with all of these people converging Jesus sees the woman and he notices her he looks at her dead man is being carried out of the city he's the only son of a mother who is also a widow and so in all of that melee Jesus is there with his eyes fixed upon her uh, he sees the need so compassionate people are focused on the needs of individuals they're not just addressing a group, but they're interested in addressing individuals. One of the uh, great crimes, I think, of, of the pastorate is that often pastors or evangelists have no problem in addressing groups and telling them what they must do and how they must act. But when it comes to entering into the lives of individuals, they don't have time for that. And that's a real problem. So for them, it's all about, well, you know, I counsel from the pulpit, and if people aren't there on Sunday, then that's just too bad. Right? Well, no, that's not the way Jesus was. Jesus went, he saw the needs of individuals, he entered into the lives of those individuals. He got involved in what they were doing. That's the way compassion is. So he saw the woman, he had compassion on the woman, and then he told her not to cry. It's through the compassion that he had for her, the fact that he had noticed her, that is what set the stage for being able to tell her not to cry. You know, that, that's, that's a startling command when you're looking at a grieving mother. Um, we get to verse 14, he came and touched the open coffin and those who carried him stood still and he said, young man, I say to you, arise. So he who was dead sat up and began to speak, and Jesus presented him, the dead man, now living, to his mother. And so this progression continues, right? It's not that Jesus just has compassion and he does nothing with it, but he speaks, he acts, he touches the coffin. And uh, many commentators point out the fact that he had defiled himself when he did that, but he was willing to do that. There's always this hierarchy in the mind of Christ. Sabbath, you know. The Sabbath is there for, for us, not the other way around. He made that point. And so for the disciples to walk through a grain field and to, uh, to retrieve some grain uh, from the stalks and to eat it, uh, they have to. Yeah, they have to survive. There's a hierarchy of needs. You know, I'm not talking about Maslow, but just from a biblical sense, right? And so uh, he who is dead sat up and began to speak because that was the greater need then. And, and, and Jesus presented him to his mother. 
I think it's hard to imagine this idea of losing a child, no matter what age that child is, right? Um, I, I don't, you know, we, we've been through it as far as um, miscarriages many times, but thankfully not, not having a child that's been with us for some time and then dying, that, that's tragic, it's difficult. It's always difficult for parents to outlive their children. They, they don't expect it. They want their children to live not just a, you know, a little bit after they, they are gone, but they want them to live for years after they are gone. And then they want grandchildren to live in. And especially in this ancient you know, society where continuing the name and continuing the family was a really big deal. And so this was really difficult for her. There's some intersections too with other Bible stories that I was thinking about. For example, David lost his son Absalom when Absalom was a young man, an adult, just like the, the widow here in Nain. And, and it's a strange thing for a parent when, when your children are not living for the Lord and they don't have any desire to live for the Lord. You struggle with it. You really, you have a hard time with it, but you don't stop loving your children. They're still your children. I often look at my boys and now that they're becoming young men, I, I, I remember when they were toddlers. I remember when they were this big and they, they would cuddle up on my chest and I would take a nap and they'd take a nap with me. I remember those days. It seemed like they were yesterday. And so when you, you think about those things and then you lose someone that close to you, it, it's a sadness, it's a depression that you spiral into that is very, very difficult. And some people never really get over it. I wonder about the Lord Jesus himself as he watched all of this unfold. I mean, he knew one day that he would be nailed upon a cross and his mother would be there and she would greet him, him die. She wouldn't be left alone. Jesus would provide for her and John and she had other uh, sons and, and daughters as well. But, but this idea of losing her husband and, and losing Jesus, her, her oldest son, uh, very difficult, would have been very difficult for her. So all of those situations just are intersecting. And when, when her husband died, whenever that was the widow of Nain I'm speaking of, when, when he had died, at least she had the son to comfort her, right? But now that the son has died, she has no familial comfort or support but the city is with her. There's something about this woman that engenders the support of the city. Maybe it's small, I don't know. It says it's a large crowd though. Maybe the idea of, uh, of pointing that out to us is to show us that people cared about this woman because she was a woman of integrity. And so the heart bleeds for people like that, especially we, we think in our minds, I mean, we know that none of us deserve anything. But, but when we look at certain people and they go through what they go through, we say to ourselves, why that person? And why not me, right? And so I think all of these struggles are going on as both crowds uh, come uh, and converge and Jesus looks upon the woman. Like I said, I'm sure there's a lot of people that uh, are compassionate here, but, but he is God and he has the power to look at this woman the power to tell her not to weep because he has the power to resurrect her son. I don't have that power. You have that power? Okay, none of us have that power, but Jesus had it. So when he tenderly asks the mother to stop crying, he knows what he's going to do. He can say that. I mean, I would never even think to do that, to tell a mother at the funeral of her child, stop crying, All right? I mean, it doesn't even compute, but for Jesus, he could do that because he walks up to the coffin, he touches the young, the coffin, and he says to the young man, I say to you, arise. You know, it's other interesting point in all of this is mother doesn't ask for it. The disciples don't request it. People from the city aren't saying anything to Jesus about it. Jesus, out of his heart of compassion, approached this woman and he just simply and authoritatively works a great miracle. And verse 15 adds that he presented the young man 
to his mother. I can't imagine that. It's just amazing. And what do we want to see? Well, that, that's interesting too. Verse 16 says, Then fear came upon all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen up among us, and God has visited his people. So a lot of things happen as a result of Jesus raising this young man from the dead, but not what we expect. Because usually we zero in on the microcosm in the ministry of Jesus, right? Where we're looking at maybe the woman and the way that she responds with great faith to the Lord Jesus. Or maybe we expect the young man to say something, but, but nobody speaks in the microcosm, right? And there's no response from the individual. It's everyone that responds in this case. Two large crowds, one situation. One woman involved and her son that has died. And yet when Jesus does this great miracle, we want to hear from both of them and we don't hear from either one. Instead, fear comes upon all who are assembled. They glorify God. That's the second response. Then number three, they acknowledge that a great prophet was among them. And then number four, they say that God has visited his people. Yeah, that, that's, that's the way the ministry of Jesus is. It's all about the glory of his Father. He came to do his Father's will. And it's, that's where our lives intersect with Jesus, right? Because that's the way that we live. At least it's the way we should live. We should be living for the glory of God. That's our one goal. And so this story, it teaches me a lot of lessons. But, but one of the greatest lessons it teaches me is where compassion leads. Compassion leads, the, com the progression of compassion leads to the glory of God. That's what this story teaches me. And that's, that's very significant because that's the main message of the New Testament. Only Jesus can help them. I couldn't help anyone really who is depressed or struggling. And sometimes I get this idea as a pastor that, that people think that I have all the answers, I don't have all the answers, you don't have all the answers either. We, we come to the end of ourselves, we understand our limitations, but we speak and we take actions and we do that out of compassion because we understand that when we can't, Jesus can. And we're looking to him to be able to help the people that are around us. Remember that our text states that the Lord saw her in verse 13, then he had compassion. Only then he speaks. Only then he does something about her situation. And so I empathize with people. Remember, we talked about that last week. I empathize with people by listening to them, especially when they're depressed and they're struggling with grief. I need to enter into their situation and, and grieve with those who are grieving, weep with those who are weeping, and rejoice with those who are rejoicing. But the compassion aspect can't be faked right? You, you can't have a compassion on an individual uh, unless it's genuine. I mean, I guess it could be contrived. I've seen people contrive compassion. But, but, but genuine compassion is something that the Holy Spirit produces in you. That's what makes you go to great lengths for people that most people forget about. Most people don't have time for. And so if the depressed person's pain is really moving me, if it really is moving me, then I can be sure that God, the Holy Spirit, is working in me. That glorifies God right there, to know that God is working in me. In my own humanness, I'm more concerned about my own needs, but then somehow the Holy Spirit works in my heart. I have compassion for that person, and I put their needs ahead of my own needs. That is not natural. That is something that is spirit produced. And that leads me to ask this question of myself when I'm face to face with that person. What can I do at this very moment to help this person who is struggling in front of me? How can I extend grace? How can God channel grace through me in order to help them? And if I'm going to help people find their way back to, especially Christians finding their way back to abiding in Christ after going through a season of depression or living in that fog, moving from depression to the joy 
and, and the glory and the pursuit of ministry again. If, if I'm going to be able to do that, I had better be a person who is living it. In other words, I can't help depress people if I'm depressed too, <laughs> right? And, and I can't help a person believe if I don't believe. And so I think that that's one of the things that we get from this idea of compassion. You're feeling together with the person. And, and sometimes depressed people, when they're coming out of depression and a friend has helped them, their testimony often is, you know, when I couldn't believe, they believed for me. Now, we know that we can't believe for another person. You understand what I'm saying? What I am saying is they were there for me and they supported me and they strengthened me when, when all hope was lost. So if, if I want a depressed person to know that God hasn't abandoned them, well, then I can't fake it. I can't walk around in life and think that God isn't interested in my life. Because how, how am I going to tell a person that God is always with you? He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you if I believe that God has forsaken me. I can't help people if I don't have this experiential knowledge of God and moving forward in my relationship with him. I, I say to the depressed person, you know, the promises of God apply to you, and yet I don't trust God uh, to provide for me, right? That's crazy. And so one of the greatest things that we can do to help depressed people in our lives is to make sure that we're living a vital Christian life, that we're depending upon the promises of God too. We need to, you know, inform our feelings. We can't allow our feelings to guide us. That's Depressed people need to know that, but we need to know that too. Right? I know it is true. It doesn't feel true, <laughs> but I know it's true. And so I follow knowledge, and by faith I believe what God has revealed to me, and then the feelings come along afterward. That's the way that it always works. You know something, you believe it, and then your feelings follow. Don't let your feelings govern the direction of your life. That's what Jesus would tell us in that. And so if we're really going to help people, if we're going to be a strength to them, then we got to tell them what is true, and we have to believe what is true. Let me suggest these four things. Number one, God is going to use the state of a person's depression to conform them into the image of Christ. Because God works all things together for good, even the evil things and the struggles that we go through. God will work it together for good. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 and verse 29. Secondly, our Father did not spare his own Son, but delivered him up for us all. So, here's the progression. How then will he not also freely give us all things? Romans 8, verse 32. He will. He'll provide a way out of the gloom. He will. Third, what I want all depressed believers especially to know, I mean, de depressed unbelievers, they need the gospel. But what I want depressed believers to know is that Jesus will never leave them. Jesus will never forsake them. And they can have uh, light and life again. And then finally, depressed people, they need to know that God hears their prayer. Psalm 5 is great along that line. God hears their prayer. God hears them when they cry out in the dark, when they think nobody's listening. God is listening. And God is providing the grace that they need to get through another night. If I expect depressed brothers and sisters to believe things, I need to believe them along with them. Compassion. Healing together. But, but remember... Before I feel together with a person, I have to know the truth. I have to believe the truth. And I have to take them with me. That's the idea. And so we need to really get back to the basics when we're talking uh, about depression. We need to keep on loving God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then number two, we need to love others as we love ourselves. We don't give up on depressed people. Instead, we ask God for the heart of compassion that we need. And God will give it to us. And God will give us plenty of opportunities too because there are plenty of people that are hurt. Let's pray. 
Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here this evening. Thank you for the truth about compassion, about empathy. Now, as we we look at understanding depression in the coming weeks and, and the nuts and bolts of things, help us to continue to go back to this idea of empathy and, and compassion and to apply what we learn to lift people out of the fog. And Lord, we pray that you might even help us if we're struggling uh, this evening so that we can live lives that are worthy of you, lives that will bring glory to God. We ask for Jesus' sake.